Good morning. Welcome to Holy Word for Worship today. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and it's a pleasure to lead you in worship. Welcome to uh, anybody that's joining us online. Also, a special welcome to any visitors that we have with us today. Uh, it's good to have you here with us, and we hope you enjoy and are, and are encouraged by our worship service. At some point during the worship, please pull out the blue connection card in the worship folder and fill that out for us. Uh, give us your prayer requests, uh, some feedback about the service. We'd love to get that from you. Our staff prays through those prayer requests every week, so uh, we enjoy that and enjoy being able to lift your prayers up to God on your behalf. Uh, we also have a staff nursery, so if you are here and you have some little ones and want to put them in the nursery, that's the room on the back. On the left, as I'm looking at it, the light saw the light just turned on in there. So if you want to make use of that, and I see Terry Roarstrom is back there, uh, please, please make use of that. Our service to God is, is good, and it is important. And especially when we serve God and serve others, love them out of his love for us and motivation by his love for us, it is a pleasing, it is a God-pleasing thing. But there is one thing that's better, one thing that's more essential, and that is God's service to us. In fact... Our highest form of worship, which is what we're here to do today, our highest form of worship is receiving God's service to us, what he has done for us. So that's the theme for today, and uh, Pastor Patterson will be bringing us a message from Luke chapter 10. It's the account of Mary and Martha, and uh, we look forward to that. Let's open our service today by singing the opening song as we let God speak to us and as we receive his service, his good word for us. Speak, O Lord. Let's sing it together. Please stand. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. We begin our service today by confessing our sins to God using the responsive words you'll see up on the screen, also in your worship folder, and we'll let God speak his word of mercy and forgiveness to us. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy and gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing the song of praise, Take the World, But Give Me Jesus. You may be seated. Our readings are printed out for you in the bulletin. They'll also be up on the screen for you today. Our first lesson comes from the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 18. And back in Genesis, chapter 12, God came to Abraham, and he told him that he and his wife Sarah would give birth to a very special child, 
in their uh, elder years. They were, when God came to Abraham, he was 75 and his wife was 65 at the time. And they would wait for another almost 25 years for that child to be born. And as we can imagine, over those years, they struggled to trust in the promises of God. God, in our lesson for today, chapter 18, so again, this is almost 25 years later, uh, through divine messengers, God comes and he assures Abraham and Sarah that she would indeed give birth to a child. In fact, that it would be about a year later. Like Sarah, as we'll see in the reading, we sometimes doubt or even maybe laugh at God's promises and his purposes for our life. But in love and mercy, God gives us and serves us with exactly what we need in those moments of weakness. He gives us his, assures us of his power, of his promises, and of his forgiveness. Follow along as I read to you from Genesis chapter 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And she did. This is our Old Testament reading. Our New Testament lesson comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Here we see the Apostle Paul express his thankfulness to God for the Christians that lived in Colossae for their faith and for their uh, acts of service to God and to others. We also see him boldly pray to God, asking that God would use the power of the gospel to uh, continue to give them uh, understanding and wisdom, help them grow in that wisdom and understanding, and to grow in their uh, works of service, bearing fruit to God. Again, he focuses on this power of the gospel in their lives. And just like it was for the Colossians, the power of the gospel is exactly what we need in our lives. And it's the way God serves us by giving us the power of his gospel. It brought us all to faith, as Paul describes it here. It brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into Christ's kingdom. And it keeps us in Christ's kingdom until death. Follow along as I read to you from Colossians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Timothy helped him write this letter. To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven, and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it 
and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and praise him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is our second reading for today. Now the young children in the congregation come, can come forward, and uh, I have a message specially prepared for them. I know you guys are wondering what I'm doing up here, right? Because Pastor Joel is normally the one who gives the children's message. Well, Pastor Joel was on vacation this week. He got back late last night, so I told him I'd do the message for him. So I have a couple things for you today. Um, what is this I have in my hand? A what? A phone, a cell phone, right? How many of you, well, I dare ask this question. How many of you have a phone like this? Okay. That's a good thing, I think. None of you have a phone like this. Not yet. How many of you have ever used a phone like this, though, before? Okay. How many of you have ever played a game on a phone like this before? Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. All right. So I have something else, too, besides this phone. I also have this. Do you know what this is? Maybe a what? It's an iPad. That's right. Uh, let me open it up here. This is, this is my daughter's iPad. Oop, she's got a bunch of messages on there. So, yeah, so it's an iPad. How many of you have ever, well, so how many of you have an iPad? Okay, a few of you do have an iPad. How many of you have ever used an iPad before? Okay, have you ever played games on the iPad before? I've done other things on an iPad? Okay. So, what, whether it's an iPad or a phone, what can sometimes happen if you use it, use it, use it, use it, use it, use it, use it all the time and forget to do something special with it? What, what do you have to do with it? Charge it. That's right. Otherwise, what happens to this? Yeah, it runs out of battery and it dies, right? It goes black and you're maybe in the middle of the game and you're like, no, oh, no. Or the phone, the same thing can happen. You have to charge it, right? You have to plug it in and charge it. Otherwise, it can't keep going, can it? Right? It has to be charged into the source of power. Otherwise, it just can't keep going. Well, this, the phone and the iPad remind me a little bit of us in our relationship with God because we can do things for God and we can love other people, right? And we can serve other people and God wants us to do that. But if we forget to regularly get recharged with God, we're going to be in trouble. So, do we charge with a, with a cord like this with God? Plug into a wall? No. How do we get recharged with God? Okay, pray. How else do we recharge with God? Okay, praise Him. Those are all things that we do, actually. How do we get really recharged with God? Through... Through his word, <laughs> yeah, through his word, okay? We're, yes, through the Bible, that's right. We're here today, and as we listen to God's word, like we just did in the reading, and in a little bit, Pastor Patterson's going to give us a sermon where he speaks to us God's word. It's actually when God speaks to us through his word, and that could be you reading the Bible on your own. It could be sitting here in the pew. It could also be listening to maybe someone speaking on the radio about God or preaching a sermon, 
many, many ways. Could be listening to a podcast on your phone about God. But that's how God recharges us. And it's very, very important. In fact, it's even more important than our service to God that we let him serve us by telling us about his love for us, telling us about everything he's done and will do for us. That's how we get recharged, okay? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you and love you and love others. But help remind us, especially today, as we listen to the sermon, that what's most important is that we let you speak to us and that you feed us uh, with your love and mercy and promises. Amen. All right. You guys can return to your seats. Thanks for coming up for the message. We'll continue with our uh, song before the sermon, Let Us Ever Walk With Jesus. Good morning. Grace and peace is ours through our Lord Jesus. 
in my preacher's heart of hearts, when I daydream, one of the things I like to daydream about is getting eight or 12 mature Christians away for a weekend and calling it a peace retreat. Just, just to hang out with a few Bible texts and look at the words of God and learn to appreciate them, believe in them, and ask how they give us peace. You know, Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have trouble, and you're all living in the world, but in me, you'll have peace. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And if I were to do a peace retreat, this little Bible story would be the first scripture when we are away from our busy lives that we would sit and look at. It's only found here in the Bible, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. It's only a few weeks before Jesus is going to die on the cross for the whole world. His life's coming to an end. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, these three adults, siblings, live in the same house. They live two miles from Jerusalem. They are a very uh, frequent stopping off point for Jesus. He went there a lot. He received from them. He didn't just give to them. You know, for every person and every leader, there are people that most of your relationship is giving to them, and there are people that much of your relationship is mutual. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus trusted in Jesus. They, they believed what he said. They got him, but they also opened their home and said they would be his, his uh, headquarters in the area whenever he needed it. And he believed them, and they were to be believed. And he went there a lot with his disciples, sometimes by himself. This time he has a, his disciples with him, and he stops off at Bethany. Now, Martha seems to be the older daughter, the older sister, and maybe the a lead personality in the house and lead, lead in hospitality. She wants to make sure Jesus and the disciples have food, have food the gift of their home she's ready to give. All of you that have hosted people know what that means. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work, and a lot of planning, and a lot of timing. And Martha probably it was used to pulling Mary in and telling Lazarus, stop being distracted and come help me <laughs> so we can get this done. And Jesus, this time, He's really doing what he always did. But this time, it's kind of unique because he's in their home and he's not, he, he, he passes by the chit chat and he starts to talk about very substantive stuff. He's actually teaching in their den. And you have the, they, remember I said they believe in him. They believe he is God come to save us. They believe he is the Messiah. They believe he is all human, but that he's also divine. And they are, know him very well, so they've even probably heard his sidebar commentaries on, on healings that he's done. Uh, it wouldn't be too long after this that he would uh, raise Lazarus from the dead. They, they trust in him, and they, they've all listened to him. If you, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, Martha and Mary... They read back to Jesus off the back of their mind and their grief the whole story of the gospel that when you die, your soul goes to heaven and your body is raised up on the last day and it's all because of God's grace. They, they knew that. They listened. So here's Jesus, their Jesus, our Jesus, your Jesus, my Jesus, teaching in their den. Mary, she is not going to miss this. She wants, to, she wants to hear her Savior. So whatever Martha's marching orders were, she excuses herself from them without telling her. She slips into the den and sits on the floor in front of Jesus, probably sitting on a, he's sitting on a couch. She starts to listen. And Luke tells us the story. It's on page 10. It'll be on the screen. It's not very long. Just enjoy listening to it again. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. 
But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and she asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. You know, languages have pictures to them. The, the original language is, tell her to pick up her end. <laughs> Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Are you fascinated by how comfortable Martha is with Jesus? Don't you care? Remember everything I said about her believing he, who he is? Don't you care that she's left me? I mean, where's your sense, sense here? We're, we're doing this for you. We opened our home. She's got some accusation in her voice. They're close, though. She, she knows their relationship's durable, and she, he can handle that. She wants to know what's on his mind, wants his help. She wants to, she's task-oriented, right? She's, I want this meal to go well, and you can get Mary, of all people, you can get her up and get her to help me. I love Jesus' answer. Absolutely love it. Because it protects Mary and invites Martha. And when he says, Martha, Martha, it's very endearing in their language to do that. Martha, Martha. I'm about to tell you something heart to heart between the two of us. You are messed up. <laughs> you're you're, you're a, a big hot mess in your head. You're, you're worried and troubled about many, many things. Like life is complicated. And it's not. There's only a few things in life that are needed. There's only one thing that's needed more than everything else. And it's what I'm doing right here in this den. I'm teaching God's word. Human beings need to remember and need to know. This is a, this is a huge part of this story. Human beings need to remember and know that God's word is a very precious and hard to find commodity on the earth. I don't mean just passages. I mean what they mean for your soul, where the word becomes not just the written word, but it becomes a living, breathing word, and it comes into your soul. I am here in your den in living color. I'm God with utterances coming out of my mouth that are about long after you're gone from this life, the one thing that's needed for you. Mary's heard that. And she made a decision to leave helping you to choose to listen. Now, there's a, there's a theme. You, you, this is important for, uh, for your learning to read your Bible like Mary. There, when, you, when you hear this story, if you'll just take a step back, and what I mean is open, open it up in your Bible. It's in Luke chapter 10. And go to like chapter 8. And then just read real quickly, as fast as you can without losing your train of thought. Go through chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. And you'll see Luke, inspired by God, has collected these stories that are in this part of Jesus' life where Jesus and the Father in heaven keep talking about, listen to Jesus, listen to his word. In, in that section that before you get to this story, there's this story where Jesus' mother and brothers try to come and get him because they think he's gone crazy. And he says, who are my mother and brothers? And then here comes the same thing he said to Martha. He said, those who hear the word of God and keep it safe for themselves. They treasure the word that they hear. My mother and brother would come to listen to me. They would be blessed. <laughs> right? After this story, Jesus is healing people and he's changing people's lives, the direction of their lives by the teaching that he gave. He's saving the lost. And some lady says... Blessed is the womb that bore you. Your mama should be so proud, we'd say in Texas. You know what Jesus said? Truly blessed is anyone 
who hears the word of God and treasures it. You see how he kept staying on that theme? People kept trying to be more on the visible and the surface and the outward, and Jesus just kept bringing them back to, I am on a mission here to bring you the kingdom of God and his word for your souls and to save you and your soul. And I don't want you to miss it because you're thinking about my mama must be proud or dinner has to be served or you might lose your job. Or like in Luke 12, your brother won't share. Jesus was out teaching the word of God. And some guy goes, hey, could you help me? My brother won't share the inheritance with me. (laughs) Just imagine all these people, including Martha. Jesus watches these human hearts. And we're always dancing around. We're busy and distracted about lots of things. And he brought the thing that saves the soul of all of us lost creatures The gospel, the good news, the word of God. So he's in the home. Martha, Martha, you're troubled about many things. I wonder, I wonder if there's any Marthas here today. Is there one that's not? Probably not. We're all Martha at some moments every day, right? You name it, we get distracted by it. It could just be our wandering mind with all, it could be the devil and the demons throwing thoughts at us that are crazy and weird and repetitive and they keep dragging us down the same old paths. Worthlessness, darkness, temptations, guilt, shame, fears, ambitions. Jesus once said the kingdom of God's like seed that's sown among the thorns and the the pleasures of this life and the successes of this life as well as the fears and anxieties that's like choke it out he saw it choking out Martha so he invited her to come sit down we'll eat later I'm teaching you some really good stuff here Martha by the way notice for your own sake dear American that he's not just saying Martha rest and relax you're you're too busy and you're working too hard you need to take a vacation vacations are very important and very good but if you take a vacation and you do not use the rest even if it's a peace retreat for a weekend or it's a week long or it's a morning and you you do not rest in the words of God that you take into your heart while you're resting you'll be left as empty as you were before and a vacation without the word of God as part of your life ends up leading mostly into just kind of an addiction to pleasure and getting away and self-fulfilling and it's not really leading you into service not leading you into peace the way Christ brings peace not leading you into productivity the way that he wants you to be productive just a sidebar unplug but then plug into Jesus I've been watching Christians for 50 plus years that I know of, watching intently. I'm going to say what's probably the obvious, but I, I think it needs to be said. The Christians that are healthy, spiritually, and productive, and consistent in their walk as a, a, a person of spirituality and faith and walking with God and in Jesus. What Jesus would say in the parable of the sower, they produce 30, 60, and 100 fold what was sown in their heart. Christians that are all of that are regular in worship for the right reasons. Not just to come as an outward, but to come when they come, not just critiquing in their mind the surface stuff, but they're coming to what word from God, what, sa- what does the sacrament bring me? What does my baptism really mean? What is, what is that word that's being shared? Regular, treasuring, keeping the word in worship. In some kind of Bible study with other Christians, also to be back and forth with other Christians around the word of God and 
and really together celebrating and like Mary and Martha could be with the disciples and Jesus in the dead. And thirdly, personally being a self-feeder. Recognizing that the words of God are living and powerful and that if you take time away to be in the word by yourself, that it's a get to and not a have to. It's not for anybody to see. It's not for God to see. It's not for your family to see. It's just you need it. It's taking care of the soul the way you take care of the body. And it's seeing it as a get to, not a have to. Those three things, regular in worship, regular in Bible study, regular in personal taking in of God's word. All this from the heart and not just for the head or for show. Healthy, productive. 50 plus years of watching Christians. It's always been that way. Mary, not Martha. And every one of us is Mary and Martha together. Luke's brilliant and he's inspired. He goes, whoa, I found a story in the life of Christ. The Spirit led him. I'm going to record this because by itself, it makes you think, cleanse, realign, and get back into sitting at Jesus' feet, doesn't it? It sure does. Now, we've talked a lot. We've talked a lot about the outward behavior, but we haven't actually listened to Jesus much. So let me ask the question in closing. What do you think Jesus taught there in the den that day? Think about it. What do you think he was teaching that day? Again, being a sincere reader of the Bible, you just have to look at what every, everything he taught and not imagine that he would deviate from that, right? That he's on, he's on to his something. He's on his mission. In Luke chapter 9, it says he had set his face to go toward Jerusalem because he knew his time was near, that he was going to be soon taken up to heaven. In Luke 9, 8, actually 8 and 9, Jesus talks to his disciples and he says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. You're going to be there with me. Our people are going to turn me over to the Romans. The Romans are going to torture me. They're going to kill me and I'm going to rise on the third day. And Luke says, remember, Luke wasn't there. He wasn't one of the twelve. He was later. Paul converted Luke with the gospel. Luke says, their minds were kept from understanding it, and they had no clue what he was talking about. Now, how would Luke know that? They told him later. He told us about all this stuff during those days before he went to the cross. Right? He talked about it. It was on Jesus' mind a lot, and it was the meaning of his life. So, let's just, let's just imagine for a minute. Mary... Uh, he's, he's, I'm going to talk for Jesus talking to Mary and the others. You're, you're, not, you're not just a, a happy conclusion to a whole bunch of series of mistakes in nature. No, you're, you, Mary, were in my mind from eternity. I picked your gender, the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, the time in which you live. The fact you'd live here and you'd get to see me, I picked you to be able to see me, your Lord and Savior. That the Romans would be oppressing your people, the Jews. I picked everything about you in your life, that you'd have a sister and a brother and your parents would be gone and you'd be living here without marriage uh, with each other. I picked all of that. The set time and place so that you would find me and here I am in your den. You were created, Mary, to be a servant. Here she, remember Martha goes, make her serve with me. You're here to serve your, to us and your sister and your brother and, and God. You're here to serve. And Mary, people are going to tell you, remember, lots of, Jesus said there's many things, but only one thing is needed. There's lots of things, Mary, that you're going to get troubled by, but the biggest thing you ever want to be troubled by is that you are a sinner who's accountable you haven't been a servant to everybody. You never will be perfect at it. You haven't been a servant to God. And guilt is real and it's not contrived. It's not created by some church or some harsh teacher or a parent. Yeah, they can be guilt factories, but guilt is real, Mary. We all know we failed. And don't blame and don't deny and don't excuse and don't try to cover it up by getting a buzz off of stuff. Guilt is guilt. But 
bring it to God. This, by the way, I'm, I'm thinking of all these passages I've been reading around Luke 10 and chapter 8, 9, 10. I'm just giving you what's in those passages. Repent of it, Mary. Just come every day, come home to God and be honest with yourself, honest with God. Remember the parable of the, the boy that was honest with himself and I've sinned against heaven and against you, Luke 15, the par parable of the lost son. Be honest with yourself. Repent to, to God. That's, that's your way home, Mary. Uh, but you, if you go home and you're going to get in nothing but trouble, then it, it's kind of a worthless thing, right? Just turning yourself in to be sent to hell. I came to sacrifice myself for you. All, all of my whole life, the whole meaning of my life is coming in just a few weeks. I'm going to die on that cross. They're going to torture me. All of you are going to, even if you tried to stop them, you won't be able to. And it's just going to go like a river flowing that you can't stop. And I, I'm going to die. But when I do die, you're going to hear me say some things from that cross that are going to give everyone in this planet the greatest peace and the greatest hope. I'm going to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Or it is finished. Sins are paid for completely done and I'm going to rise again and the death that you're going to have because Mary you are going to die the death that you're going to have on this earth is only a passing of your soul to glory but on the last day of this planet and judgment day is coming again I'm just telling you what's in these chapters in Luke the last day is coming and judgment is coming your body's going to rise up so when you start to see your body going and it's getting older and sicker and death death comes to your body don't have overwhelming fear because you have the promise I came and died and rose again I'm your savior I'm going to be watching up from from heaven and I'm going to be guiding all of this and I am your savior and the troubles that come in your life again I'm remembering what it's in Luke it's like a guy plowing around a tree that didn't bear fruit I'm going to actually allow from here Mary until the end of your life I'm up in heaven I'm going to allow there to be trouble and difficulty and challenges and dreams that don't get realized and disappointments and people that hurt your feelings. And I'm going to do all of that because I'm plowing around your tree. Because if I didn't allow trouble, even for you, as sweet as you are, Mary, you would not be as productive. You're most productive when I, when I, when I plow up around you and you have, you, you're forced back to realize how to live a life of love and peace and, and faith in God and beg for it. I'm doing all of that in your life. And I'm going to keep you coming back for, for grace and forgiveness so you stay connected to me by faith in me until the moment I send the angels to come and get you. And then that scariest moment is going to give way to the greatest joy because your soul is going to wake up in glory and I'm going to be your host. And you're going to find out I've been preparing a place for you and it's, it's going to be great. And so this is the story of my life, Mary. And, this is, and then Martha comes in and goes, make my sister work with me. You see what I'm doing? No. He says, it's going to be fantastic. Your life has meaning and purpose and value because of me. I created you. I saved you. I'll sanctify you, and I'll be your host when you get to heaven. You know why, Mary? Because I am God. And you are my child. Do you feel the peace of God? I do, yeah. Um, you know what Mary did just a few weeks later? They're in this room with all the people around, and Mary comes in there with an expensive vase of perfume and she breaks it and she anoints Jesus with it for his burial and everyone else is still what Luke had said earlier they're clueless and they're going she wasted all this perfume on this guy she could have sold it and given the money to the poor sounds like Martha making dinner doesn't it it sounds like somebody who came to church to critique rather than to listen rather than to value you see we may not get to have that peace retreat in an away place with just eight or 12 of us, but we just had a peace retreat in our church. You chose the better part, dear Christians. You chose to be with Jesus today and his people. And Jesus says, it will not be taken away from you. 
Amen. Let's stand and say the Apostles' Creed as a testimony that we are like Mary. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll have our prayers for the church. We'll follow that with the Lord's Prayer. Just to, uh, just to give you a little information about a, a few people we'll be praying for. Dorothy Roschke, a lot of you know her. Uh, she lives in a home in South Austin. She gets to come here occasionally. She has COVID. She's doing well, though, but we're going to be praying for her. Um, a girl named Gab Troxel. Uh, some of you maybe remember the Troxel family and had some recent communication with them. Uh, she was in a pretty serious car accident. Uh, this past week, and uh, we're going to be praying for her for healing and for recovery. We'll also be praying for um, Kara Wardell and Aaron and their child, Colton. They were in the hospital this last week just with some challenges after birth, but they are doing better in their home, and uh, we'll pray that God continues to give them health. So uh, we'll pray, and we'll, again, we'll follow that with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray to God. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and to stay plugged into you and into your love for us. Help us in faith to bring forth fruits of joy and hope to the world around us. Use your word to bring many more out of this world and into the communion of your church to share the riches that Jesus won for us in his death and resurrection. Lord God, you chose Abraham and Sarah, though barren, to bring forth the promised child. Grant your heavenly comfort to those without children. Hear their prayers, grant their godly desires. Great shepherd of the flock, we offer continued prayers for those who suffer. Many of us have friends or family that have recently gone through surgery. They may be afflicted with cancer, other chronic illnesses, or they're just suffering physically or emotionally. Today we think of Dorothy Roschke, who has COVID, but is doing well and recovering. Watch over her, Lord, and continue to make her well. We pray for Gab Troxel, who was in a serious car accident. Lord, bring healing and comfort to her and to her family. And we remember Kara Wardell, her infant child, Colton, who were hospitalized this week following the birthing process. Lord, thank you for the medicine, the technology to handle the challenges that they endured. We thank you for their supportive family. Continue to bless and keep them and keep them healthy. Lord Jesus, uh, we also pray uh, in a moment of silence now for those in our hearts that, that, we, uh, that we love and, and we know that they're hurting. Lord Jesus, care for them. Provide for them according to your mercy and love. Bring them to green pastures and to quiet waters. Walk with them or even carry them through these dark values. And when that day comes, gather them to dwell in your house forever. Finally, provider of all things in heaven and earth, we again beg you for rain and for relief from the intense heat that we've been experiencing here. Come to refresh our parched land and bring needed nourishment to all living things. We bring our praise and our request before your throne of grace in the name of our resurrected and living Lord Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever and ever. Amen. If you'd like to give to the ministry that's here or uh, in our broader church body around the world so that more people can hear the message of God's love and grace, you can do so at this time or later. There's ways to do that that are outlined for you in the bulletin. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve our Lord with gladness. Lord, bless you and keep you. The Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, look upon you with favor and grant to you his everlasting peace. Amen. Our closing song for today is, What is the World to Me? For being here today, uh, thanks to David Whittaker up in the in the balcony. Um, yes, thank you, Dave. I think this is two two Sundays in a row, Dave. You've been serving us. David's not even a member of our church, but just with vacations and everything, he jumped down to uh, help serve us these last couple of Sundays. So thank you. Thanks to everybody that served this morning. Um, yes, thank you. Just a few announcements. I just want to say, David also built that organ. Organ. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> all for free. Um, did a great job. Thank you, David. So, uh, two weeks from today, uh, following the worship service, we're going to be having an installation and a get-to-know-our-call workers, uh, followed by a barbecue lunch. Ace Martinez, I believe, is providing brisket for us. Okay. <laughs> he wasn't shaking his head. He was like, am I getting that wrong, Ace? But we would ask if you could bring a side dish or a dessert uh, to add to the meal. That would, be, that would be fantastic. And we'll be organizing that over the next couple of weeks. Actually, if you could go back there just for a second, uh, Caleb. Just, I just want to uh, just share a 
personal thought about this. I know it'd be easy to say, oh, we got stuff to do on Sunday morning, and you know, we're kind of busy. And, but th- this is really an incredible, special gift that we've been given. And I'm not trying to guilt you into it, but th- th- to, have, to have one an installation of one call worker is a, an incredible, special thing. We have two call workers that God has gifted to our congregation Uh, One of them, they brought up among us, Kurt Walker, another one that he's called from MLC. When there's a lot of vacancies in our synod, um, this is incredibly special that God would give to our church, these two call workers. And I'm super excited to work with both of them, seeing just a little bit of their work and uh, meeting them already. So please take time out to be here and help celebrate with us and with them, get to know them a little bit better. Again, that's two weeks from today on July 31st. Okay. Uh, we have adult Bible class, so Adam is going to be leading us today, telling us of the story. So uh, Elisha is involved, some boys, two bears, and a bald man, right? <laughs> so stick around for that. should be a good Bible study. Teens, you also have your Bible study today, I believe. I think Chris is back. Chris, yep. We have teen Bible class, and the kids have Bible class. Today is your movie day, so uh, we have some great things in store over the next hours. Please stick around for that. I think... I think that's it. Yes. Uh, God bless your week. Have a great week.